Comis, and today I'm speaking with Drs. Stephen Simpson and David Robinheimer. Stephen and David are both professors at the University of Sydney. They are scientists of different kinds, and they've been collaborators for many years. And a lot of their research focuses on animal diet, how animals actually find food in the wild, how they use their sensory systems to naturally and spontaneously balance their diets in terms of the specific macro and micronutrient content of the foods they consume. And we talked about their book, Eat Like the Animals, what nature teaches us about healthy eating. And it's really all about their research and other research that's gone on in this general area. You know, how is it that animals in the wild seek out and find and consume specific foods in specific proportions to get the right amount of different nutrients for their body and their needs? We talked a lot about evolution and how understanding the evolutionary context in which animals evolved and the ecological context in which they live uh, d- helps determine uh, what they eat and why they eat it. We talked about sensitivity systems like taste and how there's really just a handful of core macronutrients and micronutrients that all animals are sort of tuned to taste and how they use that to to balance their diets naturally. We talked about the types of diets that promote obesity and the types of diets that promote longevity and how different ratios of things like carbohydrates and sugars and proteins and fats and other micronutrients can promote weight gain, for example, or promote leanness or promote longevity. And we talked about how we should be thinking about human diet in the modern world, the modern food environment we, we live in. We talked about something called the protein leverage hypothesis and the impact what that is and what it might have to do with things like the obesity epidemic and why so many people in the modern world eat too many calories or not the right kind of calories to maintain uh, an optimal body weight and how that can lead to things like obesity and metabolic syndrome. We talked about trade-offs between longevity and reproduction and fitness and all of those sorts of things. And I really like this conversation because it really sort of looks at diet and feeding behavior holistically in an evolutionary context. And it's very comparative. We talked a lot a a lot about different species of animals, everything from monkeys, and apes to insects and slime molds and pandas and spiders and how all of these different organisms are actually sort of, in a sense, uh, utilizing some of the same basic biological principles to help them fine-tune uh, what they eat in the wild. And so we, we used all of that to help us understand how we can think about our own diet and feeding behavior and what is optimal for our own health and wellness. So if you're interested in diet and metabolism and thinking about what you should be eating and why and what consequences of that will be. This is a really good episode. As always, if you enjoy the content I'm producing, please like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out my free weekly newsletter at mindandmatter.substack.com. You can get all of my content and that newsletter for free on that Substack. And you, you can also find out how to support the podcast further if you're getting a lot of value from it. That helps me keep it going and keep it growing. Hey everyone, I want to take a minute to tell you about a product I use called Everyday Dose. They have created excellent coffee and matcha products with functional mushrooms and other supplements and less caffeine than traditional coffee or matcha products. I actually reached out to them because I've been using their product for about a year or so and listeners often ask me about my daily and weekly diet habits. They make a really good mushroom-based coffee alternative. It contains myconutrients with antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties as well as collagen protein to help support healthier skin, nails, hair, and joints and the amino acid L-theanine from tea leaves. Each cup has just about 39 milligrams of caffeine. That helps eliminate the caffeine crash that can come if you drink regular coffee, which has much higher caffeine levels. And they use a unique cold extraction process that results in lower acidity than normal coffee. And the caffeine microdose makes it suitable even for someone who doesn't normally drink coffee. This mushroom-based product is made using a double extraction from 100% mushroom fruiting bodies like lion's mane and chaga to maximize the extraction of micronutrients like beta-glucans, tritone, terpenes, and sterols. Other brands don't typically do this, making Everyday Dose one of the highest quality products of its kind. It's gluten, dairy, and nut-free. There's no added sugar. It's paleo and keto-friendly and made with kosher ingredients. There are no grains or fillers, and it is lab-tested to ensure quality. I really like the taste of Everyday Dose compared to black coffee and other mushroom coffees, and they have a mushroom matcha product loaded with functional mushrooms and collagen proteins, so if you like green tea matcha, you'll probably like that product too. If you're interested in a healthy coffee alternative, I highly recommend 
recommend giving Everyday Dose a try. Check out the link in the episode description or visit everydaydose.com to learn more. If you go there, you can find special offers that they have for getting a free frother and a free travel pack of on-the-go doses with your purchase. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mind and matter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure. And vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash minded matter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. And with that, here's my conversation with Stephen Simpson and David Robinhaven. Literature and, and history here in, in an accessible way. Oh, well, that's nice to hear, Nick. Thank you. Do you guys just want to start off by telling everyone uh, who you guys are and a little bit about you know your scientific background and and what your lab study today? Sure. So now, do we want to Dave? Do you want to go first, or do you want? Me yeah, to go I'm first? happy to start. Um, hi, Nick. I'm David Robin. I'm, I'm professor of nutritional ecology at the um, Charles Perkins Center, University of Sydney. Um, my background is in ecology, um, and I developed an interest in the role of nutrition in ecology at an early stage, and. Um, Basically, my interest in nutrition um, focuses on how animals interact with food environments via nutrition. It's a field known as nutritional ecology. So it's a branch of nutrition that is informed by ecological and evolutionary sciences. And rather than consider nutrition as an interaction between physiology and biochemistry, um, as in between nutrients and animal physiology, it considers uh, nutrition as an interaction between the whole organism and its food environment. And that's the perspective that I'll be speaking about today in relation to um, our work um, on animal and human nutrition. And Nick, I'm Steve Simpson, and I'm the academic director of the Charles Perkins Center here at the University of Sydney, which is uh, a really major initiative that we established now 11 years ago to bring all of the disciplines of the humanities, social sciences, physical and life sciences, and the medical and health sciences all together to try and tackle some of the large health challenges facing the world, principally the burden of chronic disease. And that's um, something which speaks to both my and David's history as biologists, as David just said. We met in the late 1980s at the University of Oxford. Um, I had been working for the previous 10 years or so on understanding appetite and nutritional wisdom in locusts, and also beginning a study of swarming in locusts, which has since extended from neurochemical events within the nervous systems of individuals all the way up to mass migration, collective behavior, global um, invasion by locust swarms. And so we started our journey in nutritional biology with that animal, with locusts. And um, over the past um, three and a half decades, we've 
extended that work ultimately um, to the Charles Perkins Center and the understanding of human obesity, chronic disease, and the interaction actually between nutrition and pretty much every aspect of health. So my, my uh, emphasis has been more at the physiological and behavioral end, leading into ecology. And David has um, really complemented those um, ex or that set of expertise. And between us, um, the story of Eat Like the Animals is very much our story. Yeah, and I, uh, I came across this book last year, and I, I really liked it. Um, so it's called Eat Like the Animals. And, you know, one of the sort of overarching reasons that I was attracted to this book is, <clears throat> you know, it's about health and nutrition, but it's not a traditional diet book. It's it's really sort of a, a, bio, a biology book in a, in a basic sense. And you guys take, you know, an evolutionary approach, which I, I think is essential. And we're going to talk about that, you know, just understanding animals as whole organisms and populations inside of environments and how, you know, considering their life history and having all of that contextual information through which you know we think about the the specifics of diet and metabolism and i'm hoping we can start at the beginning of the book because you guys start it with a really fun and and illuminating story about a character named stella and what's interesting about the story of stella is uh you followed stella's diet dietary habits very carefully and stella had no formal education never went to school stella never consulted a nutritionist or a doctor or knew anything about the science of metabolism and nutrition and yet you you tell us that stella was able to consistently eat a well-balanced diet to keep her fit and healthy so can you guys just summarize the story of of stella for us and and why you started the book with that yeah, that's a pretty remarkable story, Nick. Um, Stella ate, um, over the period of the study, Stella ate close to 90 different food types. And different, we watched, the study was conducted over 30 days, and um, on each day she ate different combinations of these um, collection of about 90 different foods that were available. Um, so at face value, it looked like things were happening. She was going all over the place from on a day-to-day -day basis. But when we did the nutritional analysis, looking at not the food combinations that she ate, but the nutrient combinations that she obtained from eating those combinations of foods, specifically macronutrients. We'll speak a lot about macronutrients. Obviously, they're not the only nutrients, but as we'll show you, they're really, really important nutrients. If you looked at the amounts and balance of nutrients that you ate on a day-by-day -day basis, um, the amounts varied quite a lot, but one thing was consistent across those 30 days. It's regardless of the combination of foods that she ate, she ate a fixed balance of macronutrients. And that told us something is very important about that particular balance of macronutrients was the first conclusion. And the second conclusion was that she has remarkably sophisticated mechanisms for mixing diets in different combinations to achieve a target macronutrient balance. And it turned out that, um, as you said, Stella didn't have reference to diet books. She didn't have um, uh, 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 nutritional calculators, none of that stuff. She did it instinctively. She was a baboon, not a human being. And that got us thinking, if baboons, if non-human species can do this, why do we get it so wrong? And we even then stepped to um, a very much more primitive organism. In fact, something that is not even an animal, um, a slime mold. And in experiments at the University of Sydney, we challenged little pieces of this um, syncytial blob-like creature. Um, we, we challenged it to solve nutritional problems. And no matter what problem we threw at it, this little um, brainless, limbless slime mold could solve those challenges. It had a, a level of uh, nutritional wisdom, which was verging on nutritional genius. If you gave it different little blobs of food, it would mix them precisely to get to the optimal intake of macronutrients to support um, its growth and development. And this is something, as I say, with no brain, um, with no organs at all. It's just a little chunk of stuff that grows 
and spreads out across the leaf litter where it normally lives. And it too shows remarkable nutritional capabilities. So if a baboon can do it and a slime mold can do it, where have we gone so wrong? So that that really is the opening to eat like the animals. And, yeah, I, and not only that, a really important detail of this is that, of course, slime molds and baboons are very, very different creatures, but the context of those studies was very different as well. Slime mold study was done in controlled laboratory conditions, and the study of Stella was done in the wild. She was selecting those food combinations from um, the foods available in the, the habitat. She is a free-ranging, in the wild, free-ranging animal. Yeah. And so, I mean, you give many examples in the book of all different types of organisms, different types of animals. And they, you know, what I took away from it is, you know, all animals, it seems, can naturally and spontaneously balance their diets, again, without taking courses or, or talking to nutritionists or knowing anything about, you know, what they're eating in terms of, you know, at the level that a human being can know. Um, and they get their nutritional needs met. And they do this, you know, they do this instinctively, as you say. And so, you know, one of the things we'll talk about is this macronutrient balance and, and what that means for a diet to be balanced and, and to be optimal for what the organism needs. But, you know, one of the things that you point out for animals is that uh, if you eat a high carbohydrate diet with high carb content and relatively low protein content, that animals, when animals do that, when they have no choice but to consume uh, a high carb, low protein diet, they tend to eat more calories overall and become fatter. And so, can you talk about you know how, how accurate and how universal is that across the animal kingdom? And what is the general picture here when it comes to fat accumulation and macronutrient composition for for animal diets? Well, the 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 capacity, as you said, Nick, to regulate, in other words, to possess separate appetites for key macronutrients that seems to be universal um, the key question is if those macronutrient appetites are forced to compete with one another because the food environment is restricting the organism to a particular balance of macronutrients that perhaps isn't optimal what does it do how do those appetites um, compete with one another and who wins that competition? And what we found in our very early studies with locusts was that in that animal, uh, the animal would prefer to maintain its intake of protein more consistently and abandon its regulation of carbohydrate. And hence, in a high carb, low protein environment, it would put on body fat. Um, it would take longer to develop to get enough protein to get to that target level. And on a high protein, lower carb diet, it would eat fewer calories, it would lose body weight and become leaner as a result of that. So in that animal, protein is prioritized over carbohydrate in that competition. Now that turns out to be true for a selection of species, but that isn't universal. Um, David, for example, has some really beautiful data from um, lowland gorillas that show a slightly different pattern. Um, mountain gorillas. Mountain gorillas, sorry, Dave. Yeah. And, and we've found that predators generally have a different pattern as well. They tend to prioritize non-protein energy over protein. And there are very good trophic ecological and other ecological reasons why that might be the case. So... Perhaps the gorilla example is worth picking up on there, Dave. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the broader point there is that, like anything in biology, there's variation according to the evolutionary circumstances of different species. Um, it seems uh, one of the reasons that predators seem not to do that, um, they do the opposite. What they do is they regulate to, uh, they tend to regulate to a constant fat. Um, content in the diet um, in a, through overall and eating protein. Um, one of the reasons they do that is they've evolved, it seems they've evolved in a very high protein environment. 
Um, and this seems to be the pattern. And this is what um, the mountain gorillas have in common with, uh, with predators. They show the same pattern of regulation. And what they have in common ecologically is that they've evolved in these highland tropical forests where fruits are, are scarce and intermittently and not abundantly available. So effectively, they've evolved in a habitat where the diet available in most of the time is between 20 and 30 percent of protein so that's getting up there it's close to to domesticated dogs so it seems that one of the selection forces on these interactions between nutrient specific appetites is the nutritional environment in which they evolve uh, we've recently shown in another species of monkey even though almost all of the all of the other species of primate that we've studied with one exception prioritize protein in the way that steve explained that humans do um the one second exception to the mountain gorilla is the rhesus macaque what they seem to do our studies in china show is that they regulate their intake across a wide range of macronutrient compositions basically ranging from about 12 percent energy from protein up to 30 percent energy from protein depending on the specific seasonal and annual circumstances they find themselves in they tend to eat to a constant energy uh, content and we now understand the environmental factors that have selected for that particular pattern mm. but as i said the broad point here is that to understand um how um why um species regulate in the way that they do we really need to step back and look at the ecological and evolutionary circumstances yeah and you know what i want to do in a little bit is take some of these examples of different species, gorillas, predators, everything, and and talk about those a little bit more in order to talk about human beings and sort of where we fit into the ecological and evolutionary picture here. But first, I think it would be a good idea at this point to talk about, you know, you mentioned, Stephen, that, you know, there's really just a few appetites out there. And when I read this part of the book, it was really interesting because you know, when we think about all of the foods that we eat and all of the flavors and all of the tastes, there, you know, there seems to be an infinite number of tastes out there that we can perceive. Mm -hmm. And yet you you show us in the book that, you know, physiologically speaking, when you look at the biology, there's really just a handful of basic nutrients that animals sense. And so can you talk about what the major macronutrients are and how that ties into some of the sensory biology that animals use in order to detect what's actually in their food? Yeah, sure. So the, the, the three macronutrients, as they're called, and they're, they're called macro because they, they provide the major source of calories in the diet, but not only calories, are fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And not surprisingly, if you look at the fundamental taste systems, so pretty well anything, you'll find taste systems that are tuned to each of those. So um, as well as some of the, the crucial mineral micronutrients for which there are also separate appetites, particularly sodium and calcium. So you'll find taste receptors, not only in the, in the mouth, but also throughout the gastrointestinal tract, which are responsive to sugars, to amino acids, the breakdown products of, of um, protein, to fatty acids, the breakdown products of fats. And so what you have is these primary nutrients, these macronutrients and their metabolites are sensed. They're sensed before you ingest a food. They're sensed throughout um, their, their journey um, through the digestive tract. And then they're sensed as they enter circulation. So there are taste receptors effectively throughout the body, including in the brain. Um, and it's there that this um, information, which comes from nutrients in food and comes from measures of the state of the animal with respect to its, um, its state of fat, carbohydrate and protein um, store or, 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 or levels of, of bodily, um, uh, if not necessarily a store in the case of muscle, it would be lean tissue. In the case of fat, it would be fat reserves, fat deposits. In the case of carbohydrate, there's glycogen stores. 
there are stores, there are circulating nutrients, there are taste systems that are all tuned such that the um, the organism is making sensible behavioral judgments in, in relation to food. And then it's extracting, it's digesting, it's utilizing those nutrients appropriately to achieve its nutritional targets. So that's really the foundation of nutritional homeostasis. And, and the crucial, I think the crucial distinction between that view of the world and the, the conventional view of appetite um, and energy metabolism is that it considers appetite as not a single thing. It's not just the control of energy. It's not just a matter of feeling hungry or feeling full. It's having specific pathways um, in regards to this um, handful of crucial nutrients that are um, embodied physiologically and compete with one another for what is ultimately the behavioral final common path um, of what you choose to eat and how much you choose to eat of it. And sitting on top of that, there's, as you say, all manner of other cues that can be learnt and associated with nutrition and nutritional quality of foods, um, where foods were, when you found them there, what they, um, what, what smells and other taste cues were associated with them. And those cues are also co-opted into the nutritional regulatory behavioral systems that underpin um, ultimately eating or not eating a balanced diet. And if you think about it, all of this, it sounds complex and it indeed is complex, but it's immensely sophisticated. And if you think about it, it's not surprising that animals have evolved such sophisticated mechanisms for regulating the precise balance of nutrients that they eat because it's so damned important for their success. They don't need just energy. They need energy in the form of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates in particular ratios. So why not regulate those ratios and as opposed to just energy overall? It's, mm. it's, um, it makes, it's pretty obvious from an evolutionary perspective that animals would evolve these mechanisms. And one of the one of the big innovations, I think, from our work together has been to develop what we've called nutritional geometry, which is a way of actually mapping exactly what David said. So if you if you can measure um, or estimate, and you can do this in experiments or in the wild, the intakes of um, multiple nutrients, particularly these key nutrients that we know are regulated, you can then develop surface maps or response surfaces to show what's the consequence of being in different places in these nutrient mixture spaces. So if you eat a particular ratio and a particular amount of, of nutrients, what's the consequence for um, everything from gene regulation and nutrient signaling pathways in your metabolism all the way through to how long you live or your risk of dying of um, some uh, nutrition-related illness throughout your life. You can map all of these things and visualize them as response surfaces. And that's turned out to be an immensely powerful way of showing the imprint of nutrition and nutritional mixtures on every aspect of the biology of organisms, including ourselves. So, you know, is it fair to say that, um, you know, to a first approximation, can we think about, you know, taste basically as, um, you know, there, there's a nearly infinite amount of flavors that, that we all experience. And yet you're telling us there's really only about five key nutrients that we're sort of specifically and strongly tuned to detect. So is it almost like color vision in a sense where like all of the colors that we see, are really just different mixtures of, of a handful of primary colors. And, and all of the things that we taste, perhaps, are really just sort of mixtures of these five key nutrients that evolution really wants us to be tracking, so to speak. Absolutely. And, and using that same analogy, there is an infinite number of wavelengths of um, light that we don't detect. Um, other species do. So you'll have the uh, the visual system of a butterfly is seeing the world very differently to the visual system of, of um, you and I. But I think in nutrition, the dimensions are rather similar across um, pretty well everything. So 
sugars, fats, amino acids, um, and some of the minerals, those are really fundamental resources for any organism, whether that be a slime mold or a person. So that's why you see those dimensions in the physiology of organisms. Now, there's more than 100 different nutrients that create a, a balanced diet. You can't, um, we think at least, uh, afford in evolutionary terms to have evolved a regulatory system where every one of those 100 has its own specific appetite the system would just freeze up. It would be unable to make judgments when it came to what to eat and how much to eat. So what you end up with is simplifying that through evolutionary time by looking at the associations that are regularly occurring between many of those nutrients and then focusing on just a small number to regulate. So you rely on correlations to get everything else you need for a balanced diet. And as I think we'll probably discuss, if you start breaking those correlations, <clears throat> then you're in for problems. Yeah. And, so and a, good, a good example of that, Nick, is, um, is primates are one of the few groups that is not capable of synthesizing vitamin C. We're reliant on our diet for a source of vitamin C. Most other animals can synthesize vitamin C. And the reason for that is that primates evolved in a fruit-rich environment where vitamin C was abundant. So they were never selected for the biochemical pathways to synthesize vitamin C in the way that other animals were. So the rule there for primates is if they just follow their macronutrient appetites and macronutrient taste responses and they balance macronutrients in the way that we saw Stella the baboon doing, they don't need to worry about vitamin C because fruits or some equivalent are an abundant source of the diet that they use for balancing their macronutrients. The vitamin C comes along for the ride. It's a correlation. They don't need a specific mechanism for it. I see. So the specific uh, tastes, uh, the nutrients that we can taste as, as a primate or any animal is really, uh, again, you could sort of use a vision analogy. So you're telling us that we don't synthesize vitamin C because we evolved in a lineage where vitamin C was abundant in the food. So there's no need to detect it. It's sort of always there in a sense in the things mm. that we normally eat. It's almost like, you know, it reminds me of like a bumblebee or something like they can see UV light and they need that to know where, you know, which flowers to go to. We don't really need to see UV light specifically. And so we simply don't have the ability. Yeah, exactly. 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 Right. Yeah. And, and the, the one difference, and I think one of the really interesting aspects of the biology of taste, which is slightly different from vision, is that the physiological response to taste, so the vigorousness with which your taste neurons fire when you um, uh, detect a particular um, taste compound, that is part of the regulatory system as well. So as you change in your um, state with respect to carbohydrates, for example, the way in which you detect sweetness changes. So that is itself part of the feedback that controls appetite. And we showed that very early on working in our locusts, where in that case, the way in which the taste receptor itself responds, you can manipulate precisely by changing the status of the animal with respect to either carbohydrate or protein. So when the animal's protein deprived, its taste organs respond incredibly vigorously to being stimulated with a, with a, a mixture of amino acids. And they do so independently of their sweet response. So when they need sugar or need carbohydrates, they taste sugar much more vigorously. And so what that means is the animal tastes what it needs and eats what it tastes. And that gives a really simple mechanism for making wise choices as it moves around its nutritional environment. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's really the explanation for why, you know, a baboon in the wild with no uh, declarative knowledge of all of the facts and the science can spontaneously and naturally come to this balanced diet. They're just literally following their taste buds. 
not just their taste buds, but um, the taste buds and the rest of the regulatory system, the appetite system. There's learning involved as well. Mm -hmm. um, as Steve said earlier, it's a complex suite, but they're literally following the direction of those biological mechanisms. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. And so, so even the. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Nick. No, no, I was just going to pick up on that. But if you come back to our locus system again, um, we found that if you render a locus protein deficient for only four hours, so that's not very long, um, it will subsequently be attracted by smells or visual cues that it has learned to associate with high protein foods. And it'll only be attracted by those cues if it's protein deficient. If it's protein replete, it won't. And you can do the same for carbohydrates. So learning is another uh, another way of really sharpening up these fundamental feedbacks that involve taste, um, and clearly in the in 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 the world of a foraging primate, there'll be lots of other learnt associations that'll be linked to the nutritional quality of the foods involved. And so, is it fair to say that um, you know one one of the things I took from the book at least was, you know, we've got these basically five key nutrients that all animals can pick up on. You've got fats, carbohydrates slash sugar, protein or amino acids, and then calcium and sodium as, as two key micronutrients. Is it fair to say that our bodies evolved to care not about how much we're eating per se, the total sort of volume of all the stuff we're eating, but really the ratios of each of those things? And we, our bodies will motivate us to eat as much as we need to, to get sort of a minimum amount of some of those key nutrients or get them in the right ratios. Yes, so so uh, uh, ratios emerge from regulating amounts as well. So it's a bit hard to disentangle the two, but the, and and hence why we use the geometric um, metaphor of the target. You can imagine this point in nutrient space, which is a particular amount um, of nutrients A, B, C, D, or what have you, and it's represented as a point. And you need to, your job is to get to that point, that target. To do that, um, you could either go around your world and find the food that has the exact same ratio of all those things and eat that until you hit your target point. Or alternatively, you have to zigzag your way there by selecting complementary foods, which on their own would never allow you to get there. But you could mix them in a way to allow you to get there. And that's very much what Stella the baboon did. Um, the slime mold can do the same thing as well. So in, in that case, um, as Steve said, it's ratios emerging from regulating amounts of different nutrients to meet specific requirements. But um, nutrition is complex, and there are many cases where it's not the amounts that are primary in the same sense. It is the ratio that's primary. So an illustration of that would be the ratio of calcium to phosphorus in the diet. If that ratio is off, you can't absorb into your physiology through the gut. Say, for example, the ratio of phosphorus is too high and calcium is limiting. You can't absorb that limited amount of calcium because the high levels of phosphorus prevent it. So in that case, in order to meet the specific amounts of the two nutrients physiologically, the animal has to ensure that what it eats has the appropriate balance of calcium to phosphorus. I see. And so in order to perform this balancing act, you've got to have the sensory systems that can detect all of these things, which I think all animals do. But it would seem that you also need to have, uh, you know, also need to be in a food environment where you can choose from the the appropriate range of things to do this balancing act. And so my question is, how universal is this in the animal kingdom? And in particular, I'm thinking about animals that sort of have no choice as to what they eat. So for example, if I'm a spider and I build a web, I can't choose what type of uh, insect or little creature gets stuck in the web. So is this limited to animals that can just sort of move around and, and choose from a, a wide range of food sources? Or is there something that allows all animals, even, even like a spider, to do this? Well, the spider example actually speaks to one of our experiments where we asked that very question of um, 
insects or predatory insects and arthropods, including spiders, uh, can you regulate your intake of macronutrients? Because at the time, people felt that predators didn't need to because you are what you eat. Why would you bother um, measuring your relative intakes of fat and protein, for example, um, when all you need to do is eat prey? And, and we showed in different sorts of um, predator that they had different responses. And in the case of the web spin, um, spinning spider, it kind of has to deal with what it catches. So you get something that's stuck in your web. <clears throat> How do you actually deal with that to get or to extract a particular ratio of nutrients that might be your optimal? And what we found there was uh, the answer is by spitting in different ratios of digestive enzyme. So they spit their enzyme into their prey, they turn it into a nutrient soup and they suck it. Um, and if you put different amounts of proteases, lipases um, into your prey, you can suck out different ratios of protein and fat. And that's exactly what the spiders did. In other cases, if you're a free ranging predator, a beetle or a, a, a or another sort of free ranging spider, then you you can catch things and reject them if you if they don't meet what you need, or you can selectively catch them. So it depends what you are and how you go about finding your food. But in every single case, they're regulating uh, either pre or post ingestively what they're acquiring from their food environment. I see. So, so this is why I was emphasizing the complexity of the, the full suite of regulatory mechanisms is that in different cases, depending on, for example, the complexity of the food environment and the, the range of foods that are available, different stages in that process will be doing the homeostatic regulation. We gave a good example in relation to vitamin C and primates, um, um, a species where they can't obtain Vitamin C from the foods have evolved physiological mechanisms for synthesizing vitamin C, and that enables them to live in environments where fruits aren't an abundant part of the diet. So exactly right. In different species, um, different uh, components of the regulatory mechanisms adapt to the specific ecological circumstances. But even so then, with the they're... same goal, balanced diet. And there'll be circumstances where the environment, for whatever reason, um, makes it hard to achieve that balance. So you can't easily select between alternatives to get to where you need to be. Uh, and it's there that you see the expression of these competitive interactions between different appetites. So David has some really lovely examples in um, orangutans, and we work together with um a fab Annika Felton, fabulous primatologist, looking um, at free-ranging spider monkeys in in South America. Same system um, at different times of the year. They have availability of different sorts of food. So, Dave, you you should tell that story. Well, it's a very again a very complex interplay between what's available, what they eat, and how they process what they've eaten physiologically. Um, in the case of orangutans um, and many other species, um, uh, as we said earlier, the priority is to ensure that on a daily basis they get the correct amount of protein for the reason that Steve mentioned earlier. We can't really store protein um, in the same way as we can store uh, fats and excess carbohydrates in the form of fats. So that the orangutans are much looser in terms of the regulation of fat and carbohydrate and they go through periods in which they, because of the lack of available fruit, they, um, they've got to draw on fat reserves um, in other periods, fruits are abundantly available. Then they overeat fats and carbohydrates and they store it as fat so that they can draw on those reserves at a later period. So you can see their regulation taking place via two mechanisms and across different time scales. On a daily basis, it's a question of selecting which foods are eaten. Um, proteins prioritized at that level. In the longer term, it's a question of storing and retrieving from storage nutrients that um, vary in the environment at a much longer, over a much longer time scale, such as fats and carbohydrates in fruits. So it provides a very clear illustration of the, the, the interplay 
between natural ecological cycles in food availability is food selection using the mechanisms such as specific appetites and taste responses and other mechanisms and the physiology, how it mediates those relationships. I think orangutan is an example where I collaborate with um, a wonderful orangutan biologist um, in the United States, Erin Vogel, is probably the the example that we know in most detail um, from primates in the wild showing how physiology interacts with behavior and ecology in this way. And highly relevant, as no doubt we will um, speak about shortly, to the human situation. Mm -hmm. And so... We, we've talked about this a little bit, but we haven't named it. Can you tell everyone what, what is this thing called the protein leverage hypothesis? And how does this tie into uh, what are some of the, the, the key groups of organisms that are sort of primarily concerned with hitting their a minimum amino acid requirements? And then maybe we can go into after that talking about like other types of organisms uh, that you mentioned earlier that think about th think or that behave as if uh, they want to hit minimum fat requirements and things like this. So protein leverage hypothesis, what is this and how uh, widespread is it in the animal kingdom? Well, protein leverage is um, essentially where the protein appetite is prioritized. So protein intake is prioritized in food environments where you can't get to your target. So in other words, if protein is diluted relative to the optimal concentration in the diet, then protein leverage is the phenomenon whereby the animal will increase its food intake to um, get closer to its protein target, thereby largely abandoning its regulation of non-protein um, energy intake. So if you dilute protein with fats and carbohydrates, and it doesn't matter which, then the animal will overconsume total energy to get to its same intake, or at least to approach that intake of protein at the target and vice versa. If you put the animal onto a higher protein to non protein ratio than is optimal at the target, then it will under consume total energy because it hits its protein target sooner um, before it's met its um, its total caloric intake, um, even thereby losing weight as a result. So protein leverage is essentially the expression of um, the competitive interactions between different appetite systems where protein is prioritized. Um, so the protein leverage hypothesis was our um, positing that this mechanism is perhaps an explanation for the human obesity epidemic. Um, it is our protein appetite system interacting in a food environment where there has been a consistent um, dilution of protein in the food environment by incorporation of large quantities of industrially processed fats and carbohydrates. I see. So if you're in an environment where you're relatively low in protein uh, abundance, you need yeah. proteins just to run, you know, we're made out of proteins, right? So every animal needs a minimum amount of amino acids to build its proteins to just do cellular physiology, generally speaking. Yep. So you need to have a minimum amount of amino acids. If you're in a food environment where there's maybe more uh, carbohydrates and fats and other things compared to protein, your body's basically going to motivate you to keep eating any number of calories it takes for you to hit that minimum amount of amino acids to just run the stuff of your body. That That's the basic idea? Yes. That is the basic idea. And getting back to the orangutans, you can see why that would have evolved. Because for the orangutans, there's a benefit to overeating fat and carbohydrate in um, in situations where it's abundantly available. Because predictably, within their ecology, there are going to be periods when there's a fat and carbohydrate shortage. So this energy that they store can then be drawn upon 
one in other circumstances to be adaptive. But of course, in our changed environment, that's very different because if we dilute protein in the food supply, we don't go through, go through in, in modern industrialized food environments periods where, where there's the complementary imbalance of too high a protein relative to fat and carbohydrate, in which case we would draw off the fat reserves. And so the one, you can see, yeah, the, and the, the one very special thing, as you said, Nick, about protein of the three macronutrients, it not only yields energy, but it has nitrogen. And you need nitrogen to build tissues, to reproduce, to maintain tissues. And therefore, protein has a rather special place amongst the, the three macronutrients. And in the human diet, it's it's the it's the smallest of the three in terms of its contribution. Uh, the the standard human percent protein in the diet, give or take, is around fifteen percent of total calories. But those are really important um, calories because of the nitrogen. So unless we're able and we're not to fix atmospheric nitrogen. Um, like a legume, um, because we can't do that, we need nitrogen in protein in food. Mm -hmm. So another way of thinking about it is um, if protein is a dual purpose nutrient in the sense that it provides that nitrogen, um, as Steve said, whereas fat and carbohydrate don't, but in circumstances where fat and carbohydrate are scarce, many species, humans included, can to some extent um, derive uh, carbohydrate in the form of glucose from the, the surplus amino acids that they've eaten, so that it's a source of energy as well as a source of building blocks. You can see then why it's a special nutrient, can't be stored, and it's a dual-purpose nutrient. So you know you've mentioned so far so certain animals seem to be tuned uh you know in the competition so to speak among all of the appetites uh protein can for some organisms take priority and this is the protein leverage hypothesis keep eating stuff until you get the mean minimum amino acid requirements your body needs but you also mentioned earlier that other organisms uh, seem to use like a different macronutrient as the one that gets prioritized. Can you maybe reiterate some of that a little bit? And what, what are sort of the key differences between these different groups of organisms that are, you know, protein leveraged versus fat leveraged and so forth? Well, one of the key differences um, with predators, and we think um, mountain gorillas, we haven't done the measurements yet, and we've got a good idea that it happens also in the um, uh, rhesus macaques that I mentioned is that they have a very well developed physiological ability to deaminate um, excess amino acids to go through a process known as gluconeogenesis, the same process I just referred to previously, where amino acids are physiologically processed to give rise to excretory nitrogen plus a source of glucose that forms that that. Um, that is channeled into energy metabolism. So they've developed um, physiological means of overeating um, surplus amino acids and channeling them into energy metabolism. And that physiological means of, of doing that means that they're able to overeat protein to a much greater extent in circumstances where they're fat and carbohydrate limited because that overeating of protein um, uh, provides a glucose to uh, partly compensate for the low carbohydrate and fat availability. So it seems the, the key issue is a physiological adaptation enabling those species to more effectively uh, channel amino acids into a surplus amino acids into energy metabolism. Yeah. And so it's very interesting because there's something almost a little counterintuitive to a lot of people here, I think, which is you're saying gorillas and predators like a lion or a tiger or something, because their diets are naturally so high in protein, they have physiological mechanisms that allow them to effectively deal with that protein and use it for energy and so on and so forth. Right. Naively, you would think, well, gorillas are basically vegetarians. They're not going to have uh, a lot in common physiologically with predators. And yet they do, because in fact, both types of organisms, despite this completely different diet on the surface, at least, they're actually both very high in protein. And, and that's what really matters is the macronutrient composition, not the fact that you're eating vegetation per se, or animal meat per se. 
Exactly. And so foods are not a they're, they're not a um, an end in their own right. They're means to an end, and that end, as we said, is obtaining a balanced diet. Um, in the case of gorillas, um, the a food that contains very high protein, thirty percent, in some cases up to fifty percent of energy from protein, um, are leaves, particularly young growing leaves that are relatively low in fiber, very high levels of protein. So it's very interesting to see how, in those circumstances, as you say species that are seemingly worlds apart in terms of the foods that they eat they have underlying commonality and that is very high protein diet and they adapt in the same way through what's known as convergent evolution to dealing with those high levels of protein in similar ways david yeah. i think your panda example is another beautiful one of exactly that you should tell that story nick would love it yeah, exactly. So giant pandas, um, I did a study with a group of colleagues in China um, looking at the uh, case of the giant panda where it, um, as you probably know, it's um, it has this reputation of being an extreme herbivore. It's extreme herbivore because it feeds exclusively on plant material, exclusively on one group of plants, which is the bamboos, and that particular group has a very low nutrient content, partly because it's it's heavily diluted by fiber. So the macronutrient content of, of um, bamboo is very, very low, complete opposite to seemingly what you see in predators. Um, and the um, paradox is that pandas belong to a group known as the carnivora that are largely um, uh, uh, carnivorous or omnivorous, the bears and the lions and dogs and so forth. So what we did is we thought, well, let's not think about the absolute levels of macronutrients, but from the work that we've been doing more generally showing the importance of the balance of nutrients, let's have a look at what the balance of macronutrients in that bamboo is. And it turns out the balance of nutrients is right up there in terms of percentage energy contributed by protein with what an exclusive predator like a wolf or a lion would be eating. Between 50 and 60% of energy in the diet of pandas comes from protein. So what that shows is that, in fact, at some level, at the physiological level at least, um, giant pandas aren't at all an extreme example um, of a herbivore. Their diet is very similar to the diets of their ancestors, which is a carnivorous diet. And that then ex potentially explains the evolutionary conundrum of how it is that a carnivorous group can evolve into such an extreme herbivorous group. It's mm. not extreme at all. There's a bridge there, and the bridge that uh, very, a very short bridge, actually, is the one of macronutrients. Interesting. Yeah, so pan so, so in a sense, this, I mean, this is sort of a weird way of putting it, I guess. Pandas are almost like predators <laughs> that prey on bamboo, in a sense. <laughs> We, we call them macronutritional carnivores. It, it, the level of food, they're not, but at the level of macronutrients, they certainly are. Okay. So, I mean, this is all interesting, but now we're coming to something which I think is especially interesting. Uh, it'll take me a minute to unpack this, but just for listeners, we've all, I think, had the experience, uh, you know, plugged into the internet and we all care about we, we hear a lot of stuff from a lot of people about diet and nutrition because it's a topic everyone cares about. Everyone cares about how they look and how they feel, and we want to eat what we want to eat, but we also uh, know what happens if you just indulge in in different things too much. And you know, there's every opinion under the sun out there about diet and nutrition and what's best and why. But I think you guys are sort of really giving us a method here for maybe cutting through some of the noise. And so what I mean by that is this. You've got some people out there who say, well, I mean, humans are omnivores, right? We eat, we eat animal material, we eat plant material. It's, it's about a healthy mix of both. Other people you know, on one extreme will say things like, you should really be eating an almost exclusive plant-based diet. You know, Vegans would be the more extreme example of this. Um, animal uh, protein and things like this uh, are not good for you and you should be eating only plant-based things. And then you've got the opposite. You've got people who are the so-called carnivore saying, no, no, humans evolved to be mostly carnivorous and therefore we shouldn't be uh, eating all that much plant-based food and, and it should be mostly meat. And based on what you've told us so far, if you just look at the physiological adaptations that an organism has, you can sort of tell what kind of food environment it involved in. So for example, you know whether it's uh, wolves eating 
animal meat, whether it's the panda eating baboon or the mountain gorilla, they have physiological mechanisms that allow them to deal with a very high protein diet. And so if we start to use this sort of evolutionary lens and think about the type of diet we you know, should be eating, quote unquote, or that we evolved to deal with most optimally, what kind of organism are humans? Are we biased towards so being first, carnivorous omnivores? Or are we biased towards being plant-based omnivores? How do you guys think about that? So the first thing is that humans, what characterizes humans, what's the most distinctive thing about our diet um, historically and evolutionarily is the extreme diversity. So that, as you've just said, the humans that subsist on um, largely plant-based diet living in tropical forests, and there are humans like the traditional Inuit that live on a largely animal-based diet, um, and and all um, intermediate. So we're exceptionally generalist at the level of foods. But if you think about the problem as we do, not so much at the level of foods, but at the level of nutrients, then there's a very strong signal in everything that we see that humans are a typical primate in the sense of being adapted, principally adapted to a diet that has approximately 15 to 20 percent of energy from protein. Um, and you can see the, if you look at the central tendency, what human populations across the globe and possibly probably throughout history have tended towards is that ratio of macronutrients and protein from, um, from energy. There are some exceptions, but as, as we've seen in ecology, we can also explain those exceptions because species like the, the mountain gorilla that evolved from a, uh, a group that and largely is frugivorous. The lowland gorillas have evolved specific adaptations to cope with that environment in the same way as human populations, such as the traditional Inuit, have evolved specific adaptations to cope with a very high protein diet. But the, the, the strongest signal of all is given the option, humans will choose a diet of approximately 15% of protein, of energy from protein, regardless of the foods that that is combined from. And you'll see if you look across the globe, um, no human population with food sufficiency exists on less than a 10% protein diet, nor above 25 to 30%. So there is a range which is highly typical of humans in their natural environments. Um, but as David said, we're the cockroach of the primate world. <laughs> um, we can make use of just about any um, latitude and any food environment that is thrown at us, um, and we'll turn it into an appropriate food culture. I see. So we're protein leveraged, so we will keep eating to get at least a certain amount of amino acids. And when you say when you cite this fifteen percent number that like sort of the average person will typically get approximately fifteen percent of its calories from protein, is that a modern human like us living right now, or is that like a hunter gatherer living in a traditional uh, uh, human ecology that we evolved from? It's kind of both. Um... We know from randomized control trials that that is what a human, a modern human, will select in an appropriate experimental environment, controlling out all the world compounders. So there's something fundamental. It's a signal of our regulatory biology. Um, the uh, sorry, what is your your previous question? Oh yes, yeah, so I was just asking: Is that fifteen percent number? Is that a measurement that comes from like modern humans today in, in the modern yeah. uh, food environment, or is it uh, uh, you know what, what we yeah. think the ancestral uh, situation was? Yep. So, so um, up until recently, it was believed that in the ancestral Paleolithic situation, um, diets were higher in protein than than that. In some cases, substantially higher. And it's true in relation to extremely temperate environments. But but th those examples are humans making the most of a bad situation. Um, most hunter-gatherer populations, new information indicates had a relatively low protein diet ballpark within within that that region, subsisting to a large extent on a plant-based diet. Not exclusively, of course, hunting played an important role. We are omnivores, um, animal foods fed into the diet, but most populations had a relatively low um, carbohydrate diet. But there's one key difference between 
the 15% of protein that we get um, in modern food environments and the 15% of protein in hunter-gatherer diets. And that is another dietary component that's critically important for health and for appetite regulation, and that is fiber. We live in an environment that where protein is diluted by processed foods that not only is protein stripped out of it, but fiber is stripped out of it, and also micronutrients, the range of things that in a hunter-gatherer diet we would obtain through the correlation through correlation, as we discussed previously, that is also stripped out. So that combination of low um, fiber, um, relatively low diluted protein, um, and uh, also palatability, sort of flavor and some things that make these foods uh, uh, super attractive. That's the killer. So in an environment where 15% protein exists in a complex real food, um, based food environment, it's very different to 15% protein in in a processed food environment. Mm-hmm. And this is this is really where I wanted to go next is, you know, why why can Stella the baboon effortlessly and naturally uh, balance her diet? And yet human, we can't, you know, but we know about nutrition and we're smart and we have big brains and yet we're completely going off the rails, it seems. It sort of sounds like your hypothesis for this has to do with this protein leverage uh, phenomenon. We, we, our bodies are going to motivate us to eat as much as we can to get at least a certain amount of amino acids. And so if the modern food environment is sort of uh, dilute for protein and higher in carbohydrates and, and lower in fiber in these things, that the reason we keep eating is to get that minimum amino acid requirement and having that high carb, low protein, low fiber combination is literally going to cause us to be fat. And high fat as well. It's, uh, it's yep. not just carbs. Yeah. No, exactly. And the, it, it comes back to what we said earlier, the protein leverage, protein leverages food intake. And if that translates into high energy intake, then we'll have a problem. So in a, in a plant-based diet or a diet which is um, low in its energy density and low in protein, Protein leverage just ensures that you eat enough food to gain enough protein. And in doing so, you don't overconsume calories. But if you strip out the fiber and you replace some of the protein and all of the fiber with easily digested um, non-protein energy in the form of particularly industrially processed fats and carbs, then protein leverage is going to leverage energy intake, not just food intake. It's really important um, to emphasize that we haven't lost our ability to regulate macronutrient or dietary intake in the way that we see other species, including, including Stella doing. And we've shown that, as I said, we've done randomized control trials in controlled environments where we can show that humans regulate to 15%, roughly 15% of um, energy from protein. And uh, if, if, if you drop it experimentally below that, they overeat energy. In fact, in our experiment, they put on weight. And if you go above that, they undereat energy and, and lose weight. So we haven't lost the ability, but what's happened is that our environment has been subverted in a way that those evolved biological mechanisms backfire on us via that protein leverage mm-hmm. mechanism. Mm-hmm. So there's a, a wonderful example, Nick, when when you're starting to become low in protein, there's a, a particular hormone that's released uh, largely from your liver called FGF21, And in our experiments and others around the world, we've found that what that does is it turns on your protein-seeking appetite. Um, And that means, apart from anything else, that the taste of protein becomes highly salient. It becomes very attractive. And if it happens that the taste of protein, which is umami and savouriness, is coupled with fats and carbohydrates, then we're going to be led astray. And that's exactly what's happening um, in the savory snack food industry, for example. Um, and we showed this in a in one of our clinical trials in Sydney, where we found that people on a lower protein, a 10% protein diet, ate more calories. They did so principally by increasing snacking between meals 
on snacks that had savory flavor characteristics, even though we'd controlled everything and were fooling them essentially, we'd created protein decoys. And that's what is happening out there in the environment at the moment. And it's remarkable how little we get it wrong. So if you look over the last 50 years, um, total protein intake as a proportion of calories has only fallen by, you know, one or one and a half percent. Um, but that has been enough to drive more than 10 percent increase in calorie intake because of this leverage effect. And it, that's a pretty good uh, regulatory response, but not good enough. And because it's cumulative. So those mechanisms, as we said, with the orangutans as an example, they evolved in an environment where that's a good thing. You know, overeat fats and carbs, but we no longer have a period of the you know, orangutan equivalent of fruit shortage. So it's cumulative. That small amounts accrue over long time is to um, give rise to the problem. Mm -hmm. So another thing I want to ask you guys about that ties into all of this, and this is something that not all people, but many people, uh, many non-scientists and even some scientists, when they think about diet and we talk about what is the best diet or what is an optimal diet, the piece that's crucial that people often leave off um, as the next part of the sentence is for what? Yes. And I want to talk about <laughs> trade-offs here and in particular, you know, something that's very basic in biology. I remember learning about this stuff, you know, in grade school when I learned about ecology and things. Um there are trade-offs between sort of reproductive output and volume and longevity. So, so for example, we could talk about the best diet for reproductive purposes. We could talk about the best diet for living the longest life possible. We could talk about the best diet for, you know, getting jacked and building muscle or becoming like an elite athlete. And though there's not one diet, I think that fits all of those. I think there's going to be trade-offs between each of those things. Can you talk a little bit about some of the core trade-offs and how those tie to macronutrient ratios for things like longevity versus athletic performance and things like this? Yeah, you're exactly right. And you can add to that there are different optimal diets at different stages of life. So the optimal diet for an infant is 7% protein, high in fat and carbs. That is certainly not the optimal diet for somebody in their 20s, but it's breast milk, and that's perfect for an infant. Similarly, as you get into, as we've shown recently, women around the menopause have a higher protein requirement because of the hormonal changes that accompany um, that transition, leading to the loss of lean mass that you have to replenish in a higher protein diet. Likewise, when you get in, in either sex to an advanced age, your efficiency of retaining bodily protein starts to decline and therefore you need to eat more protein. If you're metabolically challenged, if you have insulin resistance, then you start to lose body protein as well. Um, and that's as a result of insulin not inhibiting protein breakdown as it normally would. That means your protein requirements have gone up and unless you change the composition of your diet, you're going to be in trouble because protein leverage will drive increased intake of non-protein energy. But you're right, these trade-offs are fundamental features of the life history of all organisms. And the most fundamental of all <laughs> is between reproduction and longevity. These, these are two outcomes which require two different nutritional um, strategies. If you're going to live longer or reproduce maximally, you can't do so on exactly the same diet. You need to trade off one against the other. And traditionally, it was figured that there were... Um, that they were sort of um, built in trade offs. If you used energy for one, you couldn't use it for the other. Now, what we've gone on to show is it's actually more, uh, in some ways, simpler than that. These are just different things, different life history outcomes that do best on different nutrient mixtures. So, across the life course, a lower protein, higher complex carbohydrate intake will support longevity particularly during midlife and into early late life. 
whereas reproduction is is maximized in a whole series of different organisms um, on a higher protein intake. So you you can, depending on what you're trying to achieve, uh, a different diet will suit those different purposes. And they, these are embedded deeply in the evolution of our life history strategies. And it translates um, all the way through to the clinic. So if you're metabolically dysregulated, if you've got um, type 2 diabetes, for example, the optimal diet to intervene in that circumstance is not the same as somebody who was healthy and let's say lean at a similar age. We need to think of diet in a more sophisticated way. And then you add on top of that genetic variants, different populations, different individuals have different genetic substrates, different genetic predispositions, and even epigenetics where you carry the imprint of even your parents and grandparents' life um, lifestyle in your regulatory physiology and the way your genes are expressed. All of this ultimately will influence what's the precisely optimal diet for you in a given circumstance. Um, I think you can simplify it, however, without having to get right down to precise individual nutritional determination if you listen to your appetites and put them in the appropriate food environment. And you know that's the we... key thing we've shown in several species now that as nutrient requirements change in that way um, to align their nutritional intake with the optimal life history that they've evolved in specific ecological circumstances, their nutrient selection changes accordingly to track those changing requirements. Um, and from what we've seen of human regulatory systems, there's no reason why the same shouldn't be true for us. In fact, there's every reason that it almost certainly is. So we don't need to do complex calculations. What we one need to do is we need to decide three things. We need to decide what we want out of a diet. And I think it's true to say that in modern environments, the goal is a healthy, long life because we're not reproducing to levels. Most of us who are fortunate enough to live in medical environments are not reproducing to levels where we need insurance numbers of children to be born because almost certainly some of those are going to be die at childbirth and beyond. Um, we, we're basically reproducing to replacement values, so we don't need a high-protein diet for that, but the goal is to assemble a diet that gives us a long, healthy lifespan, which is a relatively lower um, protein diet. The other thing to remember is that we don't need to calculate that. As we said, our biological mechanisms will lead us to that outcome. If that's what we want, we just need to ensure that it's in the correct food environment. So let's think about this um, maybe even yeah, more concretely. So when we say the correct food environment, let's imagine a human being today living in America or Australia, the, the, the so-called Western world. Let's imagine a middle-aged person, 30s, 40s, let's say. Um, they Their goal is to uh, lead a long, non-obese life. <laughs> Where, where in food space, what, what does their diet look like in terms of macronutrient composition? That would, we, we would guess from the experimental data, comparative data from across species and also looking at human, natural human populations and um, age specific mortality estimates. And we've done and others have done a lot of this work in particularly in recent years, that that would be a, a modest, low to modest protein diet, probably around 15%, perhaps even slightly lower than that coupled with um, high levels of fiber and complex carbohydrates and healthy fats. Um, to do that, you would need, you could do that in many different combinations, of course, that so you can, you can achieve a, a given nutritional outcome endlessly in terms of foods and food likes and dislikes and ideologies and cultures, but you would require quite a reasonable plant-based um, components of your diet to do that. Um, Animal-based proteins or plant-based proteins could allow you to do it as well, of course, but um, it, it would be a whole food, 
low junk food diet, which is full of healthy plant derived fiber, relatively low in protein um, of balanced amino acid complements. So that requires you to mix protein types, particularly if you're eating largely plant based proteins or to incorporate really healthy um, proteins from animal sources. Mm -hmm. And is what you're getting at there with the protein that the amino acid distributions are going to tend to be different for animal versus plant-based proteins? And if so, can you kind of describe that for people? Yes. Yeah, so, so there are certain amino acids that are particularly um, prominent in, in certain foods and certain uh, animal-based foods. The branch chain amino acids, for example, tend to be higher in animal and in plant-based foods, but that's not entirely true. You can find um, you can find plant-based foods and animal-based foods that allow you quite simply to 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 get some somewhere near a balanced amino acid complement. So amongst those amino acids, there's 20 that are common um, protein amino acids. There's about nine of them, give or take, that are required in the diet. And if you get their ratio wrong, you can end up with um, outcomes that are undesirable. So too high a branch chain amino acid intake is, is known to have bad outcomes in all sorts of different ways, but is also necessary if you want to build lean tissue. If you want to grow muscle, you need branch chain amino acids. Um, so you need as much as you need, not more. I see. And I suppose and, that that's where sort of lifestyle comes into the situation. So totally. the, the amino acid content by volume and and its composition would be different for two identical people with the exception that maybe one of them is lifting weights a lot and the other one is not right. doing that so much. Right. Your target is different is the way we would construe it. And so, um, so one of the things I want to talk about a little bit more is so on the one hand, in the book, you talk a lot about how basically for a protein leverage species like our own, if you have a high carb, low protein diet, relatively speaking, that will tend to give you more longevity and help you have a longer lifespan, but it's not good for uh, sort of your, your reproductive prowess. Um, and then in the other direction, right, it goes in, in the other direction, a higher protein, lower carb diet is going to make you uh, perform better on the reproductive access, uh, but it's going to come at the expense of lifespan. And the thing that, so that made sense to me based on everything you presented in the book, but it also confused me with respect to a long-lived species like humans in particular. And I'm hoping you guys can unconfuse me here because on the one hand, the idea is, as we just said, high carb, low protein means longer lifespan. But at the same time, that's also the diet that tends to promote things like obesity and metabolic disease, and that those things should should not promote long lifespan. So, uh, is th is there something I'm missing there? No, no. Um, we call this the protein paradox. So, so everything you said about a low protein, high carbohydrate diet is true, and we are a low protein species. We have. Uh, our, our diet is relatively, as we've already said, low in protein, exceptionally low in protein as an infant. So that fits with our being a long lived species for sure. Uh, no, the problem, the answer to the paradox comes um, in two things. One is that our protein requirements change across the life course. So a low protein diet, as we just said earlier, later in life, very late in life, sort of 60, 65. Um, uh, well, that's not very late. I'm already there. But um, <laughs> uh, when, when you get beyond 65, your requirements for protein do go up because naturally you're less efficient at maintaining the protein that you eat for useful purposes. It's like there's a, a hole in our protein bucket. Um so, so it does change across the life course. But the really significant um, solution to that paradox is that the quality of macronutrients matters a lot, in particular, the quality of carbohydrates. So we, for example, published just a couple of years ago, a really extensive study in mice, um, the standard sort of preclinical model for this sort of stuff, 
where we titrated protein against the type of carbohydrate in the in the diet and we showed that um, as many others have done around the world now that if you're on a relatively as a mouse on a lower protein 10 percent protein diet um, you will be longer lived and healthier um, except when the carbohydrate is in the form of in particular we found the high fructose corn syrup mixture which is a fructose mm. glucose equimolar mixture so exactly the thing that many people are getting. right yeah so what what it means is that protein leverage in a normal healthy human food environment will maintain relatively low protein intakes so it'll get you to your target but not require you to eat excess um, calories to do so because of the complexity of the carbohydrate and the matrix of fiber within which it resides. But if you put that low protein with junk carbohydrate, then you're in trouble. So the very worst diet um, under those circumstances was a 10% high fructose corn syrup diet. And to offset the costs of that, you had to in, in, to, in this mouse experiment, we had to increase the percent protein to limit calorie intake. Mm. So if you're on a, a rubbish carbohydrate diet, as a mouse at least, higher protein is helpful. But that's um, the only circumstance where higher protein is helpful. I see. And it's uh, it's only helpful because it's restricting calorie intake because of the protein leverage effect, which happens to be pretty weak in mice. Actually, they show it less strongly than humans. They do show it, but not nearly as strongly as us. So it's probably an underestimate of the human circumstance. Yeah. And I want to, well, here's what I want to discuss. And then I think there's something we want to unpack before that. So I want to talk about what what an obese person should think about in terms of their macronutrient balance to lose weight. But before we get there, I want to explicitly address a couple things that we've mentioned, but, but haven't really dove into. So you've talked about complex carbs versus simple carbs. I want to talk about that and what exactly that means. And then I also want to talk about something else you said, which is healthy fats, unhealthy fats. So taking those one at a time, What's the difference between uh, uh, complex carbohydrates and simple carbohydrates? Yes, yeah, so so carbohydrates are a, um, they're, they're on a continuum from monosaccharides, very simple um, sugar molecule molecules, to long polymers of stuck together, typically glucose, um, and those as they get stuck together in longer and longer chains. Um, they become harder and harder to digest, putting it very simply, to the point where the most abundant carbohydrate on the planet is the one that we can't, as a human, digest. Rather, few animals can, and that's cellulose. Every single plant cell is uh, surrounded by a little box of carbohydrate cellulose, which to us is inaccessible carbohydrate. So you you have either totally inaccessible carbs, carbs that are hard for us to digest, but our microbiome can do the job for us. So they're the uh, so-called resistant starches, the hard to digest starches. And then you've got the easier to digest starches that, you know, for example, found in, in uh, many grains and potatoes all the way down to um, the disaccharides um, such as sucrose, all the way back to the individual um, glucose and fructose molecules. So carbohydrates are a kind of complex um, macronutrients. They, they come in various different forms. And what we know is that if you provide sufficient resistant starch that you give your microbiome something to do, that's a really significant part of our regulatory physiology, uh, the training of our immune system and so on. It's a really important part of our biology. Similarly, if you have enough uh, la uh, largely unable to be digested star starch and, and, and cellulose in the diet, that gives the bulk that allows you to 
um, maintain a, a reasonable gut passage rate. So you slow the rate at which food moves moves through your gut and you remain satiated longer. You absorb water, so you end up with softer feces and so forth. So carbs of all different sorts are really important to us. And fundamentally, glucose is the fuel that all of our cells um, will use as their fuel of first resort. Um, you don't have to have um, too much carbs in your diet before your brain will go back to burning glucose as its preferred fuel. Um, but it can burn ketone bodies as well, but it doesn't really like doing that. <laughs> you 20 grams of carbs is enough and it'll flip back into using glucose as its principal fuel. So that, that's the spectrum of carbohydrates. Fats, likewise, there are endless sorts of, um, you know, they're classified according to their degree of saturation um, and, 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 and the omega threes and sixes and so on and so forth. It's a complex macronutrient dimension in which, as David said earlier, probably ratios are important. So the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio seems to be something that um, needs to be within a, a particular bound for it um, to be most healthful for, for human physiology. Mm -hmm. And So this so is all, all very complex. And most people, um, well, you know, myself included, when I'm choosing a diet, I can't do those calculations. I don't want to. Diets are about something different than doing calculations. They're about the joy of eating and nourishing mm -hmm. your body. Um, but we've stressed this is where food environments come in, because if you have a diet, as we said, that consists largely of whole plant-derived foods, you don't need to worry about those things. The carbohydrates that you get automatically will align with the healthy side of the spectrum that Steve has spoken about. It's when you start subverting those diets through introducing excessive amounts of highly processed industrialized carbohydrates that you get the problem. So what well, thing I'm trying to emphasize is you can really simplify the high dimensionality of these issues at the level of foods and think about which foods to minimize in the diet, which category of foods and its industrialized mm -hmm. processed foods will do all the calculating you need to get a healthy diet. Yeah, one of the things, you know, I've tried to think about as I have conversations like this and I just learn about diet metabolism is there, there's so much signal and so, and so much noise out there. You know, as you said, David, how do we reduce the dimensionality and think about well, what are the things that are always going to be true for everyone or virtually everyone? And, you know, one of the tippy top things on that list, in my view, is is basically what you just said. It's processed versus whole foods and whole foods yeah. is <clears throat> basically always going to be better. <clears throat> totally. So the other thing here is. So if we think about. Um, well, actually, let's actually go to the question um, I wanted to get to before, which is, all right, let's now imagine we're a uh, obese person. And we're in middle age. So this is a, hot, a very large and growing mm -hmm. sector of the world that we live in. Middle-aged person, obese, they want to lose weight and get down to uh, uh, a good, healthy weight. What does that macronutrient composition mm -hmm. look like for mm -hmm. their diet? So what, what we're asking then, and this is a really, it's a really important distinction. We're, we're asking what is how can we use diet therapeutically to support weight loss and to inhibit rate, uh, weight regain, both of which are hard? Um, and the answer there is uh, that there's various tricks that come to do with the timing of feeding, not eating at night, some degree of, um, of restriction during the day when you when you do eat but a higher percent protein diet coupled with healthy carbohydrates and fats and lots of fiber low energy dense in other words is going to be the combination that will most likely um, satiate and restrict energy intake and hence support weight loss now that particular diet combination will come with some side effects which may be to speed up longevity or speed speed up 
um, the biology of aging marginally. But in those circumstances, it's worth paying because the benefits for a person with obesity far outweigh um, the costs. I see. So, yeah, because you know the, the higher protein content might speed up aging a little bit, but probably not as much as metabolic syndrome and maintaining that obesity sure. and stuff. <clears throat> Yeah. So, it's, so it sounds like basically the takeaway there is if you're obese and you want to lose weight, one thing you should definitely do is have fewer processed foods and more whole foods. And one thing you should probably also want to do is index a bit lower on carbs and a bit higher on protein. Yep. Well, yep. it could be carbs really, and fat. Okay. Carbs and fat. Yep. Really important to emphasize that we're not obesity clinicians, so we're not providing specifically dietary advice. What we are doing is we're um, communicating what our research, what our observations of the literature and our own research are telling us. Yes, somebody uh, who is chronically obese needs to seek professional medical dietetic absolutely. advice. Absolutely. Yes. And as I like to put on all my content, uh, absolutely nothing on this podcast is medical advice. Um, mm. We're just we're just talking about what what uh, what we've observed out there in experiments and stuff. So, OK, so we've got this trade off between longevity and reproduction. We've talked about uh, carbs versus proteins. And um, we just talked about, you know, what the diet could look like if you want to lose weight, if you are obese and what what some of the trade offs are there. Um, how do you guys think about your, I mean, after everything that you've learned across your whole career and knowing where you're at in, you know, your life history and knowing everything that you guys know, how do you guys think about your personal diet today? Is it basically what we've been talking about where you're trying to get as many whole foods as pro possible and getting enough protein, but not more than that? How, how do you guys think about that? Uh, at, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, avoiding avoiding sugar sweetened beverages and ultra processed foods, to, uh, except as special treats. I think that's that's number one. Number two is have a love for cooking, um, the sharing and enjoyment of food and different food cultures. Very easy to do here in Australia where we have such wonderful ingredients. Um, and in, in both our cases, we were hunter-gatherers to some degree, um, fishing, uh, collecting and growing our own food is something we both get a lot of pleasure out of and our families do too. So um, it, it's immersing yourself in the pleasure of food and letting our appetites do the rest and not putting ourselves in temptation when it comes to the siren call of the ultra processed food world because they're designed to be eaten um and we're as um, susceptible as anybody well i certainly am and, so uh, i i totally agree um very similar to what steve was saying i would add one thing in my case that i really emphasize strongly the food environment. I can't change the Australian or even the Sydney food environment, but what I can change is the food environment that matters most to me, and that's my domestic food environment. So my rule is to, to shop with your brain and eat with your appetites. What I'd limit is the amount of highly processed foods that I bring into the house, because I know if I'm hungry, I'm going to reach for those if they are there. In the way that I do it, when I'm hungry, I reach for something that is not a processed food, and ultimately it's a much more enjoyable experience in any case, and it gives my biology the opportunity to do for me what it evolved to do for me, and as is true of all the species that we've studied and discussed today. Yeah, no, I think I think that's really good. Shop with your brain, eat with your appetite. Um, and I take a similar approach. I just, because I just know myself, if I whatever I buy, like I'm going to eat it if it's here. So mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time uh, not buying many things and, and not having them in the home because yeah. that's just what it takes for me. And I think it's what it takes for most people too. Like if it's there, most people are going to eat it. Absolutely. I, I'd add yeah. one further sort of sub rule to that, which I violated yesterday. Never shop when I'm hungry. I went to the gym mm. and I had to stop in to buy a few things. And I, it was a big battle not to fill 
my basket with a whole lot of processed foods because my appetites were screaming for them at that point and really important. So, so we've got this key factor of whole versus processed. And essentially, I think we can say safely, it's, it's always probably better to do whole foods rather than processed foods. And then depending on someone's specific life history and specific current state of metabolic health, that's where you have to do some homework to figure out you know, what is the balance of carbs right. and protein and other things. The mm. other thing I want to come back to that you mentioned, Stephen, is uh, the tempor- temporality here, how, how, mm. the, the when you eat. And I know that you guys have looked at this to some extent and you talked about it in the book, but I think a good question maybe to ask here to get into this is, I don't know if you guys have done it, but I'm sure someone's done it. Like the experiment where you've got two groups of animals, same exact diet, same number of calories, same nutrient profile, but one group gets to eat that whenever they want. And the other one is restricted in time in some way. How does that factor of when you eat start to come into this? Uh, it, it comes in pretty profoundly and we we're starting to understand why. And that's the, there are, really fundamental interactions between the circadian clock system, which um, really structures our physiology and our behavior across the 24 hour day um, and and is expressed in every single cell in your body. And it's controlled by a master regulator um, in the suprachiasmatic nuclei in your brain. Um, That biology intersects profoundly with your metabolism. So, insulin receptor and clock genes, for example, um, are talking to one another. So the timing of feeding, uh, restriction throughout the day of periods when you don't eat, all of these things, there's good evidence are influencing metabolic outcomes. But again, it's probably simpler to think of it in terms of our biology as it evolved. We have as a species until recently not eaten during the night when we would otherwise be asleep we've tended to be a diurnal species and um, sleep at night so we know that sleep and eating um, aren't um, able to happen well they perhaps in some people do happen simultaneously but they're normally not supposed to and simply by not eating at night um, and um, therefore having a period of overnight fasting when you're asleep is a simpler way to get 90% towards a, a healthy outcome than embarking on 5-2 diets or you know 18 um, six periods of eating or fasting and eating and so on and so forth. I think it's just simpler than that. Try not to snack throughout the day, eat in relatively main meals and don't eat at night. That that starts to impose um, a regularity that reflects our circadian biology and hence um, our healthy metabolism. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally think that... Um... I think this is an uncontroversial statement. Um, you know, if you're doing daily intermittent fasting, even if you're just restri- you're saying like what I do in my own life is at least 90% of the time, uh, I'm only eating between the hours of 12 noon and 8 PM. Mm-hmm. And I, I work fairly hard. You don't have to work that hard to do that, that level of intermittent fasting. And sometimes I throw in longer periods, you know, once or twice a month. But I think that is probably good advice for pretty much anyone, right? Don't sure. be eating at all hours. <laughs> Hmm. Exactly, exactly. And coming back to this um, interplay between aging and reproduction or growth and uh, longevity, those those two things have essentially opposing metabolic substrates. So if you're growing and reproducing, you tend to downregulate the pathways that would otherwise um, maintain tissues for the long term, and vice versa. And um, you can you can actually manage those two processes on a daily basis by um, the patterning of your feeding. So when you eat, you need to turn on growth and um, all the pathways that you need to 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 grow and maintain tissues, but you don't want them turned on endlessly. So if you eat 
and then have a period without eating, you get the opportunity to flip back into uh, the longevity mode from the growth mode. And so you're managing, you're titrating those two things, which are counterbound, uh, they're countermanding one another when it comes to uh, long, healthy life. So um, can you remind everyone, let's just remind them one more time, what's the name of your book? And is there anything that you feel like we haven't touched on in, in terms of some of the major themes and topics that, that you got into in that book? Well, the book's called Eat Like the Animals. Um, and Dave, do you think, I think we've touched upon much, if not most, yeah um i i think we have as well is there anything um so i don't actually remember when the book was written i just read it a few months ago yeah, yeah. is there anything since it's come out that's changed that that sort of we've learned because this is a very fast moving area of science i think and like right. is there anything that's that's changed in terms of your understanding of how a lot of the stuff works that mm. um has come since the book has been out that's really interesting. So 2020, it was a COVID baby. Um, it came out in March 2020. It's now in 10 languages, I think, Dave, isn't it? Where the, the Chinese edition is coming out soon. We've been asked to 11, write... 11, I think. Oh, 11, is it? Okay, so 11 languages. Yeah. Um, there, There is nothing that we say in the book that has turned out not to be supported by all the evidence since rather the opposite. So I think anything that we've said has been reinforced in recent times. The evidence base for, um, well, protein leverage has has grown substantially. We're currently writing um, a, a, the latest update on the state of evidence in regards to it. Uh, the story about protein and longevity is now um, incredibly well supported by research in labs around the world that that a lower protein, higher carbohydrate diet extends um, lifespan, particularly in midlife. Um, and I think all of the associations around ultra processed foods and the changing food environment have, have also been reinforced. And there's been a growing emphasis on ultra processed foods and their role in the obesity epidemic. And they've been a really important part is there have now been several population studies, observational studies, which um, totally support protein leverage. Um, I know there's a tendency in the nutrition literature to criticize observational studies in human populations as being uncontrolled, therefore unreliable. Our view is that they're absolutely necessary. They're as necessary as randomized controlled trials, because whereas randomized control trials can establish causality, you need observations in real food environments to establish the relevance of the causality that you've studied in randomized control trials. And um, there have now been several population studies that completely align with the story that we outlined in the, in the, in the book about protein leverage interacting with protein dilution via processed foods in transitioning food environments to drive an epidemic of obesity and disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to say it one more time, there, it sounds like you would agree that there's reasonably good evidence that at least a major driver of the obesity epidemic is, uh, maybe it's, I'll say it's two pronged. One, it's eating a lot of processed foods, but sort of deeper than that, it's that because we are a protein leveraged species, if you're getting too much carbohydrate and compared to protein, couple that with not enough fiber, that and is fat, and fat and fat, bedding fat. <laughs> carb, high carb, high fat compared to protein is a recipe yeah. for weight gain. Right. Mm. Right. Yep. All right. Well, I mean, this was, again, this is one of my favorite books that I read last year. So I think it's really accessible too. It's not, it's not super technical. You don't need to be a, a scientific expert to get a lot from this book. I love that you guys take the evolutionary ecological lens so that everything is sort of a, appropriately contextualized in terms of what our species is supposed to be doing in terms of how it evolved and, and the types of environments we evolved in. 
I love all the comparative stuff. I think that's always very con- instructive thinking about our species compared to other species, what the similarities and differences are. Um, I think there's a lot of key takeaways from this book, many of which that we talked about that are super practical for people. So thank you guys for taking the time and for uh, tuning in all the way from Australia. Um, I'll give you one more chance if there's anything you want to say or reiterate um, before we uh, head off here. No, Nick, just to say thank you for a a really a fascinating and, and deeply considered discussion. So thank you for that. And likewise. Thanks, Nick. All right. Uh, Stephen Simpson and David Robbenheimer, thank you guys for your time. And uh, if, if people are interested in the book, I'll, you know, I'll put a link in the episode description. And uh, that's it. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks.